lecture was given by uh, Professor Thomas Wu uh, from National Cancer Institute. It's in Maryland, yes. U.S. Okay. And Dr. Reed received a medical doctor uh, in 1989 uh, from Max Tram Institute of Medical Research in Heidelberg, Germany. Germany. And I think he has studied a lot about high chain gene and developed the first uh, firm test uh, for the carrier detector, detection uh, of for the Dutchin. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Maybe you can introduce yourself. <laughs> You're doing a good job. Uh, tomorrow I will invite two other professors to introduce the two speakers. Yeah, I think that would be much better. Much fun. Yeah. And Dr. Reed was awarded a three years postdoctor uh, fellowship uh, from German Research Society and spent uh, three years in different university, University of Latter, Latin, Netherlands, right? And also Yale University in USA and University of Heidelberg, Germany. And, and he was one of the pioneers in the development of FISH. Okay, that's the Foreign Institute um, Hybridization uh, for the uh, detection of human gene disease and cancer. And his, uh, his colleague was the first in conceptualized the use of array nuclear uh, axis for Comparative genotic genomic hybridization. Okay, uh, for the DNA and the RNA analysis, and got a US patterns for that. And also, he published more than 300 journal papers, uh, organized two different courses at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, and he's a uh, 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 Add as uh, editors and or add four members, and also serve as a chairman in CancelNet or German National Genome Research Network, and is the major funding source for cancer-related genome society in Germany. And in 2000, uh, Dr. Ryu received the uh, ASBMB Anwin Award um, of the American Society of Biochemistry. And molecular biology. In 2006, uh, he uh, delivered a keynote address at the 20th NIH uh, Research Festival. In 2009, he was elected as the uh, honorable members of the German Society of uh, General and uh, Visceral Surgery. So he's very important in a very different view. So let's welcome uh, Professor Lee. Very much for the kind introduction. I would like to thank the Institute, Steve and Indika, for the invitation to Hong Kong. The title of my talk is Genome and Transcriptome Dynamics in Cancer Cells. And I will briefly describe to you uh, the initiative that Indika and I proposed, which is called the 4D nucleum. The topics I will touch on are, I will present to you what we know about chromosomal changes and patterns of aneuploidy in carcinomas. Can you hear me in the back, all right? Uh, I will show you how we can, what we learn from these studies, improve cancer diagnosis. We will then come to more basic research and ask the question, what are the consequences of chromosomal aneuploidy on the carcinoma transcriptome? and structure-function relationships of gene expression, which directly is related to the NIH Common Funds Initiative, the 4D nucleum. Before I start, most of the work uh, that I will present today was done by Kirsten, Denny, Dara, Marcus, and Iriana Torres, and um, Rüdiger. Maya. We have uh, numerous collaborations uh, with uh, surgical departments in Germany, in Sweden, 
and on the bioinformatics side with the University of Maryland, Aitan Rupin and Indika and his team in Michigan. So what you see here is a spectral karyotyping or short sky analysis technique that we developed um, a little more than 20 years ago. And you see here uh, chromosomes from a patient with chronic myelogenous leukemia. What you can see, there is a specific chromosomal translocation, which is an exchange of material of chromosome 9 to chromosome 22. Other than that, the genome remains normal. What happens here at the site of this chromosomal translocation is that two genes are being fused, which results in an aberrant uh, increased uh, tyrosine kinase activity, which transforms these B cells. The fact that only one genetic event is required for hematological disease in that um, uh, uh, tumor uh, is very profoundly shown by the fact that if you inhibit this tyrosine kinase activity, the, sub the, the result of this chromosomal translocation, the cells, the, the, the cancer cells actually uh, die and the patients um, achieve at least initially complete remission. So one single genetic event is sufficient. Now let's look at cancer carcinomas. What we see here is a breast cancer cell line and you can immediately appreciate these are normal chromosomes, um, 23 pairs all with one color and you can see the enormous degree of chromosomal instability in breast cancer and this is true for many other carcinomas as well. So a profound difference to the relative simplicity in hematological malignancies. What we also observe is what we term aneuploidy, and that means that the DNA content f in, is greatly different from one cell to another. What we can also observe here are uh, anaphase bridges, which are the, the, the result of shortened telomeres, and we can observe apolar mitosis. All this leads to aneuploidy. Now, looking at these images, this one and this one, let some folks conclude. If you look at most solid tumors in adults, it looks like someone set off a bomb in the nucleus. So there, was, there is the percep perception of a cytogenetic chaos induced by catastrophic mitosis karyotypic complexity, clonal heterogeneity, and ongoing chromosomal instability. And all this together made many people believe that what we see as the enormous degree of chromosomal instability in carcinomas, tumors of epithelial origin, is the consequence rather than the cause. Now, the fact that one has to study early carcinomas and try to understand the dynamics of the evolution um, of tumorigenesis was recognized very early um, here by Ingrid Granberg. But you can appreciate that the methods that she had to her disposal here, just counting the chromosome and trying to understand their structure, not even having banding at that time, was insufficient to come to a conclusion. Now, um, we and many others developed uh, um, methodologies to improve the cytogenetic analysis of tumors. Um, um, CGH was mentioned already, uh, now routinely being performed on arrays, and it allows you to measure relative copy number changes in tumor genomes. We developed spectral karyotyping interface fish where you can enumerate copy numbers of specific genes directly in interface, non-dividing interface cells. And of course, now you can use RNA-seq or global gene expression profile to ask the question, what happens to the transcriptome if these cytogenetic chromosomal changes occur? 
in the cancer cells. And having these tools, we now uh, really try to understand what happens in tumor genesis. As you know, in most instances, there is not the initial lesion is not an invasive carcinoma, but here in the cervix or in the colon, you have normal epithelium, then low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, and if untreated, it becomes an invasive disease. A similar picture here, it's just called a small adenoma and then a large polyp before it becomes invasive. <coughs> And we used a combination of tissue microdissection and comparative genomic hybridization to ask the question, is there a non-random distribution of chromosomal imbalances in, different, in carcinomas? Is there a stage-specific sequence of events? And which additional genetic or epigenetic changes need to occur in order for this sequential transformation to an invasive phenotype? And the answer is the following. I'm just showing you the results for cervix and for colon. And I will highlight, of course, we have now studied many more than 10 cases. But it's normalized for 10 cases, which already shows you that all cervical carcinomas have extra copies of the long arm of chromosome 3. In other words, this event is as common as is the Philadelphia chromosome in CML. You can see another thing. If you look at the colon, chromosome 3 doesn't play a role. But invariably do we observe extra copies of chromosome 7, the long arm of chromosome 8, increased copy numbers of 13, 20, and losses of um, the long arm of chromosome 18. 3Q gain invariably observed in cervical carcinomas, and these changes are the defining features of genome alterations in colorectal carcinomas. To summarize, what are the facts that we know about aneuploidy and genomic imbalances in carcinomas? Chromosomal aneuploidies are the defining feature of carcinomas. The dis distribution of genomic imbalances is cancer type specific, and we can discuss the relevance of that. There is actually not a cytogenetic chaos, but a stability on a different plateau of copy numbers. Some call it speciation. Specific genomic imbalances occur before the transition to invasive disease. This is very important if we want to develop it and use it as a diagnostic tool. I will show you that later. These changes are maintained during disease progression and in cell lines. In other words, they don't go away. Specific genomic imbalances persist despite ongoing chromosomal instability and intertumor heterogeneity, and I will discuss that in detail, and are therefore drivers of carcinogenesis. Now, you think you know something new? It's useful to start reading. This is Theodore Boveri. Um, he published a book in 1913, uh, in, in, he was a professor of zoology in, in Würzburg, so the book was actually translated by Marcella Boveri. She, at that time, the students came from the United States to Germany, and he then did something which one usually d d don't do anymore. Uh, he married her. Um, and she then translated this book into English, and it appeared in uh, the, the initial the German version appeared in 1913, and the title of the book is The Origin of Malignant Tumors. Mind you, he was a zoologist. He never looked at cancer chromosomes. But what he did, as uh, he frequently went to Naples, there was a marine biology laboratory there, so he mechanically mistreated sea urchin eggs, which is shown here. And what happens then is that they develop additional centrosomes. Not only two, which are required for normal cell division, but in this case, four. And then he made a conclusion, which is very beautiful. He concluded if there are additional extra copies of centrosomes, then as a consequence, there would be a cell division in which some cells have too many and others too few chromosomes. And again, never looked at cancer chromosomes. He then concluded 
To assume the presence of definite chromosomes which inhibit division would harmonize best with my fundamental idea. Cells of tumors with unlimited growth would arise if those inhibiting chromosomes were eliminated. On the other hand, the assumption of the existence of chromosomes which promote division might satisfy this postulate. On this assumption, cell division would take place when the action of these chromosome parts should be strengthened by a stimulus, and the unlimited tendency to rapid proliferation in malignant tumor cells would be deduced from a permanent predominance of the chromosomes which promote division. There you have it. 1914, before genes were known. Um, beautiful work. If you can find that uh, book, the, 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 get it. Um, at, the, at that time, it was uh, two, two, mark, uh, two, two German marks and 50 cents. I had to pay uh, 130 bucks to get it. <laughs> so that would have been a good investment. Anyway, so let's go back. Um, we have, as I said, aneuploidy and chromosomal instability. Now the question is, what actually happens during cell division? Is it like if you drop randomly a ball, one or the other? So the question that we answered, how can we reconcile aneuploidy and ongoing chromosomal instability with a strictly conserved pattern of genomic imbalances that define different cancer types? And in order to do so, we developed a novel technique which is called multiplex interface fluorescence in situ hybridization, or MIFISH, which is a novel and definitive approach to understand intertumor heterogeneity and clonal evolution. And this is how it works. In this particular case, we microdissected from a tissue section normal uh, 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 pre-cancer lesion, ductal carcinoma in situ, and adjacent to it an invasive, invasive ductal carcinoma, uh, prepared the cells, put them on a slide, and then used a set of differently labeled DNA probe, hybridized it, washed it, hybridized it again. So at the end of the day, we can visualize up to 24 genetic loci in different colors in individual cells. Uh, and this is fairly automated. Um, and the way we present the results is shown here. Um, each um, line here represents a specific probe. In blue, copy number neutral. In red, copy number losses. And in green, copy number gains. You can appreciate that in about 25% of the cells, we have a loss of one Q and so on. We have another major clone, which looks like that. Another minor clone, which differs a little bit just by in one gene, but we also have an enormous degree of heterogeneity in these tumor cell populations. Uh, we did that using fish probes for loci that are recurrently gained and or lost subject to copy number changes in breast cancers. And then we try to understand what happens during the transition from a pre-malignant ductal carcinoma in situ to a malignant invasive ductal carcinoma. And these are the results. We observe essentially two patterns. One is clonal stability, where the copy number changes that populate the ductal carcinoma in situ are the same than in the invasive component. However, we also observe clonal evolution where the major clones that define the pre-malignant lesions disappear and new clones appear. And in this particular disease, it is uh, exclusively um, um, explained by the extra copy numbers of the MIC oncogenome chromosome 8Q. We collaborate with uh, Alejandro Schäfer and Russell Schwartz to develop um, to develop and develop a, a software called fish trees to understand the phylogeny of evolution. However, despite this heterogeneity and instability, at the end of the day, chromosomes that are usually gained are rarely lost. And chromosomes that are usually lost are rarely gained. 
So in the population as a whole, despite chromosomal instability, what matters is the maintenance of copy number changes that are the defining features of these carcinomas, despite chromosomal instability. So we used another model where we try to understand the transition from pre-malignant disease to invasive disease, and this is cervical carcinoma, and in this particular case, again from the same patient, uh, the pathologists identified a dysplasia, and next to it, a carcinoma. And again, we observed two different kinds of clonal evolution. One, linear progression, because the copy number changes in the dysplasia are essentially the same as in the carcinoma. So there was a linear progression of the pre-malignant lesion to the invasive component. However, we also observed the opposite, where we could interpret that as multifocal disease, which arises um, because there is a const uh, constant uh, uh, infection with uh, high-risk human papilloma virus. In that case, you can observe that the changes are quite different. So it almost looks like an independent lesion that developed here, with one exception. The gain of 3Q is present in both. Again, highlighting the importance of this genomic imbalances in cervical carcinogenesis. Yet another project that we performed using MyFish is shown here, and here we take advantage of a huge collective of breast cancer cases uh, in uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, women treated in Stockholm and neighborhood more than 5,000, and the beauty of that, um, not, not, beauty is probably a good word, but um, um, the, um, the importance of this collection is that we have um, a, a very, very long clinical follow-up. So we can ask the question, how are those cases that have a good prognosis different from those that have a poor prognosis. And this was done in collaboration with uh, Gerd Auer, Karolinska Hospital in Stockholm, who was one of the first who realized that it is important to measure the DNA content and understand aneuploidy for disease prognostication. Here we have a diploid breast cancer. You can see very, very stable. Only a few changes from the baseline, which is a loss of chromosome 17p, P53 is gone, and the gain of the long arm of chromosome 17 Q amplification of the HER2 oncogene. And now, look how different that looks from an aneuploid breast cancer, where you have a major clone, but a lot of heterogeneity, despite the fact that, again, those chromosomes that are, used, that are gained are rarely, if at all, lost, and those chromosomes that are usually lost are essentially never gained. Again, this concept of evolution and selection for a genomic copy number change. And this is the, now the consequences actually of, of this uh, enormous degree of instability shown here. Here we have a diploid tumors. Most of the cells look the same. Only few aberrations patient alive after 20 years. If you have an aneuploid tumor, in this particular case, the patient, the women died uh, uh, less than two years after her diagnosis. And you can appreciate that the nimbleness of the genome obviously gives this tumor much more opportunity to, for instance, escape um, therapy. We sequence these tumors as well and can conclude uh, P53 mutations and loss, so P53 is gone, occur exclusively in the aneuploid cases. The gain of MYC and HER2 is associated with poor prognosis. The best prognosis group is a gain, uh, is a diploid pattern, just a gain of uh, uh, 1Q, loss of 16Q. The degree of genomic copy number changes and the degree of intertumor heterogeneity determines survival, as you can see here. 
Another study where we, uh, that we conducted where we try to understand now in a model system and we talked about cell lines before is whether we have the similar situation in cell lines which is important to understand because everyone uses it for um, studies. You certainly have heard of HeLa. In this particular case we looked at the colorectal cancer cell line SW480 and what we try to do, we try to model intratumor heterogeneity by doing single cell cloning and then expanding these single cells again to a cell line. And what we see here, these are the major clones that we see, uh, uh, the, the, the blue one, clone A, B, in different frequencies. These are actually maintained after single cell cloning. So you find them all back. Therefore, there is a maintenance of parental clones in single cell derived clones. Ploidy and morphology based gene expression changes are maintained. There is a continuous selection, and this is again the most important point here. There is a continuous selection for the imbalance profile, i.e., chromosomes that are usually gained are rarely lost, and chromosomes that are usually lost are rarely gained. And this is a central tenet of the research in my laboratory, and I will show you that in a minute. Clonal patterns are not consistent with the term of ongoing chromosomal instability, uh, which I think one can talk about it, but if one thinks there is a chaos in carcinomas on the chromosomal level, it's the wrong thinking. So, I now uh, want to highlight the, our central tenet by showing you one diagnostic application of what we have learned. And again, this is related to cervical carcinomas. And you have, have all heard that uh, women after a certain, a certain age undergo a pap, um, pap smear to detect uh, cervical abnormalities. So now the challenge here is the following. These are normal cervical cells. They are very, very distinct because they have a small nucleus and a large cytoplasm. So everyone, this is a carcinoma. Here you can see again a normal cell and then the carcinoma cells where you have a lot of more DNA. So everybody can make the distinction from here to there without much knowledge. However, this is not the challenge in cervical cytology. The challenge is to identify which of the low-grade dysplastic lesions progress to higher-grade dysplasia and invasive carcinoma. Why is that important? Because only 15% of the low-grade lesions do progress. 85%, despite the fact that they are infected with HPV, show spontaneous regression. So there is an enormous potential of over of overtreatment of these lesions that actually do not require it. And keep in mind that treatment of these early lesions, if you don't know if they progress, is surgery. So it's an invasive procedure. So we hypothesized, knowing that all these have an extra copy of 3Q, None of those has an extra copy of 3Q that those lesions that progress, actually the early lesions have a gain of 3Q and those that show regression never have a gain of 3Q. And we conducted a, uh, and, and, and we developed a, a fluorescence in cytohybridization interface test and here you can see it nicely. A normal cell, two copies. These abnormally looking cells, three copies each. And what you see here is actually cancer emerging. This is what it is. You have a segregation error. You have three copies in the, in the, in the right tissue. The cells take off. This is the early stages. This is the birth of cancer here. And we conducted a study, a validation of 3Q as a molecular marker of progression. So we took um, severe dysplasia from women that were diagnosed before with low-grade dysplasia. Another group, low-grade dysplasia, returned with no intervention to normal, and then we had a group of women which were diagnosed with a carcinoma or with a severe dysplasia, despite the fact that the pap smear one or two years before was normal. 
the results are the following. All of the severe dysplasia have a gain of 3Q. All of the carcinomas have a gain of 3Q. In the normal cells, the gain of 3Q was never observed. Long and behold, those pre-malignant lesions, same degrees of dysplasia that developed cancer already had a gain of 3Q. Those that did not, that returned to normal, never had a gain of 3Q. And in 30% of the normal pap smears that then developed into uh, the invasive carcinomas, which should not occur if you are under routine screening, already had a gain of 3Q. So there was a misdiagnosis of the pap smear, which we know can happen. And I just show you some examples here. This was a pre-malignant lesions that regressed. The cells don't look normal, but they have two copies of chromosome 3Q. These cells, again, another example, these cells um, look not normal, but two copies of 3Q. No further intervention needed. Another case, again, abnormally looking cell, you can see here, copy number increases of 3Q, here in contrast, the normal cell. Another case, so here intervention is needed because, please understand, if you have these changes, they don't go away by itself, impossible. They persist and they become a carcinoma. It's as simple as it is. And you might also appreciate the fact that Obviously, my little daughter could diagnose this because she, she can count to three. So it's very objective. You don't need to know anything about cytology. Here's another case. Unfortunately, this was identified and assessed as being a normal pap smear. And this was the woman that uh, then developed carcinoma. And you can see here these cells already additional copies of 3Q. So we can conclude, the gain of 3Q is a definitive predictor for disease progression of dysplastic lesions of the cervix to carcinoma. And uh, I'm very happy and I'm actually proud of this translational application because this test is now um, offered in the US at least by Quest Diagnostics. So let's now come to, again, having established that these copy number changes are the defining features of carcinomas. We now wanted to know how do they affect global gene expression levels? What are the consequences of aneuploidy on the cancer transcriptome? And in order to do so, we used a model. We generated actually a model of clean aneuploidy, and this was based on microcell-mediated chromosome transfer to generate artificial chromosome uh, trisomies. What you can do with this technique, you can fuse the cells, and then you have daughter cells that have an extra copy of a specific chromosome. And so we did. You can see that here, normal memory epithelial cells, um, 46 chromosomes all intact. After the procedure, we have three copies of chromosome 3 because that was introduced. The rest of the genome is unaffected by this manipulation. And then we asked what happens to gene expression level when we compare this and this. And the results are shown here. Here to control, some genes up, some genes down, which is what you would expect. As a consequence of the extra copy of, three Q, uh, of, of chromosome 3, average gene expression levels go up. Aneuploidy results in the significant increase of average message levels of genes on the affected chromosomes. The degree of increase closely follows genomic copy number. These effects are independent of the introduced chromosomes and independent of the cell type. Therefore, chromosomal aneuploidy is not only target a few specific genes, but result in a massive and complex deregulation of the cancer transcriptome. And again, try to imagine, in chronic myelogenous leukemia, one event is sufficient. Here, you have a massive deregulation because obviously the f there are many transcription factors of a given chromosome. They go up, they have effects globally. So it's really complex. And this is probably also the reason why we don't have a um, um, uh, cleavage for solid tumors, because it's just too much. 
Um, yeah, and this effect actually that we observe here of apparatus, it, it, it's, it's very reproducible here. We have seven different replicates of an introduced uh, chromosome 13. You can see some genes are very sensitive, um, but average level goes up. Interestingly, some genes escape, like in the X chromosome inactivation, the copy number induced um, uh, in, uh, uh, expression, overexpression, and we now actually explore the hypothesis that if we overexpress this gene, which is downregulated, then we can kill the cancer cells. It would be specific. We don't know that yet. Um, so, now, um, we also, now I'm coming to structure function. So, relationship of aneuploidy, gene expression, and nuclear architecture. Why is this important? Because we now know, mostly from the work by Thomas Kramer, with whom I had the pleasure to do a postdoc um, with, um, yeah, um, we now know well, first of all, we know that chromosomes in the interface nucleus are um, organized as so-called chromosome territories. So they remain intact. And by the way, Boveri was the one who first said the chromosomes uh, need to stay intact uh, during the cell cycle. But what we uh, see here is that the, the chromosome territories of chromosome 19 and those of chromosome 18. One are central, and the others are peripheral. And this correlates, correlates with gene density. Chromosome 19 is the gene, most gene-rich uh, com human chromosome. Chromosome 18, the gene poorest. So chromosome position in the interface is non-random and conserved in evolution. Gene poor chromosome 18 is peripheral and gene pitch, and uh, gene rich chromosome 19 internal. We asked the question if we now put in an extra copy of any of those chromosomes, do aneuploid chromosomes assume a conserved position? And is this possibly required for their expression, for the, for the expression of the genes on those aneuploid chromosomes? And again, we use our model of microcell mediated chromosome transfer. Here are the measurements. The uh, center of the nucleus, the periphery. We have chromosome 7, which is also gene poor, rather peripheral. Chromosome 19, rather central. We then uh, measured it again after having introduced these chromosomes. So they are now uh, trisomic. You can see chromosome 7, the extra copy is still peripheral, so is chromosome 18. The extra copy of chromosome 19 moves to the interior compartment of the nucleus. Conclusion, artificially introduced aneuploid chromosomes are transcriptionally active and assume a conserved position. Um, yeah, future work changes in 3D position during spontaneous transformation. Roles of lamins in 3D architecture and chromosome positioning, role of histone modification and DNA methylation, and this is very speculative, and we actually have a collaboration with uh, Nuri Neamati uh, in Michigan to try to see whether we can explore the fact that there is aneuploidy and aneuploidy consequent gene expression changes as a therapeutic target because it would be specific for cancer cells and this is always a challenge in treatment. What we also do, and this is more experimental, but I just want to, and, and it, this is ongoing work, uh, but I just want to show you that because you, so that you can understand our way of thinking about chromosomes in cancer cells. We actually would now like to silence aneuploid chromosomes and ask what happens? Can the cell actually survive? And in this case, we use uh, um, a gene editing, which was introduced, and putting in the exist gene onto an aneuploid chromosome. The exist gene is the one that inactivates codes. The second copy, you have heard that uh, by Dr. Engel's talk before, the second copy of the X chromosome in female cells in order to achieve dosage compensation compared to male cells that have only one. So what we try to do, we want to make an 
chromosome 7 bar body inactivation and ask the question, can these cells actually tolerate that? Because usually they have three copies in the cancer cells. And another approach is here that we introduce a negative selective marker based on the herpes simplex ferritin kinase, uh, treat the cells with cancyclovir, so the cells need to kick out the, the, the targeted chromosome and ask the question, is the additional chromosome actually not required for cell survival or do the cells then acquire based on chromosomal instability, again, the trisomic phenotype? Um, we don't know the answers yet. It's uh, a bit complicated to do. Um, anyway, let me now come to in more detail to structure function relationships uh, of uh, uh, gene expression. So this is probably the most profound example that there is in fact a structure function relationship in of chromosome territories in the interface nucleus. Again, this is chromosome 7. And these are the X chromosomes. So now tell me which one is the inactive? This one. It's condensed. This is the bar body. It, it's condensed and yeah, condensed and cannot be transcribed. So there is a direct structure function correlation based on the 3D architecture of the chromosome territories. That's why it's important. The second thing is that we now know that genes that are highly expressed are at the periphery of chromosome territories. If you downregulate the, uh, the expression of these genes, they move towards an interior compartment of the nucleus. Again, the reason transcription factors are not in territories, but between territories. So a gene that is heavily transcribed needs to go outside. And again, this is an example of a structure function relationship. So before, because I think that it is important to study structure function relationships in order to understand the nucleus. Um, we, we, we received, uh, I, I think five years ago or so, an email from the NCI director to come up with proposals for a NIH common fund initiative. And I thought, well, if he asked me, then I'll send him something. And I suggested initially the title 3D Nucleo. Before I chose it, I asked Indica what he thinks about it. And he said, Thomas, how can you think you understand biology by not considering time? So we uh, switched to, to 4D nucleon. And I presented a proposal with the with um, following hypothesis. A comprehensive understanding of any complex biological system depends on recognizing its structure function relationships from molecules to the entire system. Second. Knowing how cancer genome-specific aberrations affect the 3D organization of chromosomes in the nucleus and the tightly controlled transcriptional equilibrium is essential for a fundamental systematic, systematic understanding of cancer biology. We propose that to generate comprehensive 3D or 4D maps of the interface nucleus. How much time do I have um, at this? distinct functional states and which distinct genome mutations. Compare such maps to maps from cells at defined physiological stages. Explore how the cellular transcriptome is affected by changes to the 3D structure, and so on and so on. Modify it by genome editing um, to generate isogenic lines to study such me me mechanisms. and develop a publicly accessible pref reference database uh, based on chromosome conformation capture, 3D interface fish, high resolution microscopy, and so on and so on. And the NIH director uh, listened to that and uh, um, in fact uh, the NIH has then come up with a NIH common fund which is intended to be a flexible resource for NIH to make strategic investments in programs that will have high impact NIH-wide strategic planning is undertaken, and so on 
and so on. It's actually, it was mandated by Congress to come up with the NIH, I think some 15 years ago. So I'm very happy that this has uh, materialized and um, in DKNI and I um, edited a methods uh, oh. the book where we talk about a 4D nucleome. And uh, in my laboratory, and this is still ongoing work, we try to understand how aneuploidy influences nuclear structure. What transcription factor dynamics do in terms of nuclear structure. And we also use a model system of cellular reprogramming where we treat cancer cells and they revert, in that case, to normal myotubes. Uh, the approach is con chromosome conformation capture. I believe Indica has discussed that RNA-seq mathematical modeling, and we work with, as I said, Indica uh, in Michigan and uh, with a um, very valued input by um, Steve Smale in, 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 uh, regarding the mathematical modeling. So you might want to look up this uh, issue. There are many different articles in there. Some of them are uh, really good. Um, so we have done this. This was co uh, again a collaboration with Indica, and I'm d d will be brief here. And uh, uh, Gil Oman here we looked at the chromosome conformation of the colorectal cancer cell line HT29, and I can conclude what we found is that we have a in 3D, a very faithful recapitulation of the 2D cytogenetic changes that you observe using, for instance, spectral karyotyping. So we have increased contacts of regions that are amplified here, for instance, the MIC oncogene on chromosome 8Q. We very precisely, with high resolution, can identify chromosome translocation, and we also uh, can observe that there are specific changes to uh, the compartmentalization in active and inactive chromatin uh, throughout the nucleus as a consequence of these many cytogenetic operations. We also try to understand the problem of aneuploidy and explore how that affects nuclear structure. And here we take advantage of normal, normal colon epithelial cells. We treat them with certain conditions, what happens is that they acquire an additional copy of chromosome 7. And uh, mind you, this is also what we observe in colorectal tumor genesis in polyps. And then again, we can compare, compare this state and the derived state with a distinct chromosomal aneuploidy. What we see here, uh, gene expression on that chromosome goes up here, more green than the other chromosomes. We can also observe, it's a little difficult to see, that there are in increased interactions on the chromosome that is aneuploid. We can now, using RNA-seq, explore which pathways are affected, and long and behold, the extra copy of chromosome 7, upregulated SWINT, NOTCH, and EGFR signaling, which are all in known to be involved and important in colorectal tumor genesis. We also look at the consequences, and this is related to what, uh, what uh, you, Doug, uh, uh, presented, of what, what if we target a specific transcription factor, what happens to the genome and the transcriptome. In that case, we uh, targeted the uh, TCF7L2, which is the major effector of wind signaling. Uh, we do that because not only it's important for colorectal tumor genesis, but, uh, but we also know that increased wind signaling makes the cells resistant to chemo radio therapy. So, perturbed wind signaling activity, we are silencing of key transcription factor TCF7-2, measure changes in nuclear structure using high C and 3D fish, measure changes in transcription UN RNA sec, and this is now ongoing. Uh, Marcus Brown in the laboratory has performed a time course of um, uh, silencing this particular transcription factor in DICA, again uh, with the help of Steve, is looking at the multi-dimensional data and try to understand using differential equation, which I don't understand. Um, what is the complexity? Now, what happens over time as a consequence of the modification of a transcription factor genome-wide and in terms of structure? 
And just to give you an idea, TCF702, as I said, is uh, very important for colorectal tumor chances and for colorectal physiology because it's uh, expressed here and results in the differentiation of these crypt cells. If it's too much, you get cancer. Um, now we have uh, analyzed the data, or Indica has analyzed uh, the data using centrality analysis, and I believe El Hira has had talked about that before. And these are the initial results. For instance, we can identify the silencing of this transcription factor impacts the MIC network progressively over time. And these are the kinds of things that we perform to try to not only look at the linear sequence of the genome and how it changes in both structure and copy number in cancer cells. But we do believe that if we, un if we want to understand the dynamics and the complexity of transcriptional deregulation in cancer cells as a consequence of aneuploidy, we need to understand structure function relationships over time. These are early uh, results, but uh, we are um, very excited about it. So, uh, again, um, I mentioned most of the folks that uh, were involved um, in the projects, and I'm very pleased with uh, the fruitful and long time collaborations that we had uh, all over the world. And with that, I want to conclude and thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you. Yes. So interesting work. Uh, I was kind of curious about the, is this kind of like copy numbers and related environmental issues like does the environmental affect this kind of combination copy numbers development? Do you, have you used this kind of system to study those kind of cases? Uh, environmental changes. You say the like environmental effect on yeah. this kind of copy, uh, copy numbers. It is a question that keeps me up at night. Why is this distribution so tissue specific? Uh, and I have prepared slides for that. <laughs> Here, there was a big paper in Nature. The landscape of somat somatic copy number alterations across human cancers. And they looked at, I think, they did do an experiment, they looked at some 2,000 cases that we and others have analyzed. So they I discerned um, focal copy number aberrations, copy number alterations, whole arm and total chromosome alterations. And these are the results. And they conclude that Looking at the whole arm or the whole chromosome of copy number changes, they can discern different tumor entities. Sure, of course. And I'm not surprised. But you can see that here. Colorectal, from lung, hepatocellular, renal, blah, blah, blah. And you can also see the reason. Only colorectal carcinomas have a gain of chromosome 13, we knew that before. So, so far, trivia. Um, actually, the editor of Nature asked them to uh, contact me uh, for comments, and that's why I'm in, even in the acknowledgement of this publication. However, of course, you can discern that we know that. That is uh, from a summer, uh, review that they published in 96. Um, however, if they looked at focal copy number alterations, the classification completely deteriorated. Chromosome arm, chromosomes can separate, focal aberrations, which they think are the ones that are important on a particular chromosome, classification completely deteriorates. So, then they conclude the preponderance of chromosome arms or whole chromosome copy number changes is probably a reflection of the ease with which they can be generated. Come on. <laughs> you can classify it using the whole chromosomes. You cannot classify it using a single gene and then a structure sentence. There must be a reason behind it. 
We don't know. I, it, yeah, but I think, I do think it's a fundamental question. And I came up with this following analogy. This is a forest and this is a forest. This is a circle because no one this looks like a coma. Right? So you have two forests, two chromosomes. And you need a bad guy. The wolf and the panther. This one can never live, uh, never live there. This one cannot live here. So the environment actually makes a difference. But it's not sufficient to look at this one or this one to try to understand tumor genesis. But we don't know yet. Uh, but I can tell you what we are doing. We, and and uh, this is actually that, that arose in discussion with uh, Leon Glass, who will be here next week, I believe. Um, that maybe chromosome segregation errors are not random. Maybe in the cervix you have a higher propensity to resegregate chromosome 3. And in the colon, a higher propensity to resegregate chromosome 7. And then it's selected. But we don't know yet, but we can study that using our interface fish approach on normal cervix and normal colon to see whether, in fact, chromosome segregation is in fact random and then it's selection if you have the right chromosome in the right tissue. And the second thing is, and this is also very hypothetical, um, <coughs> but we can do it now, is ask the question whether the gene expression in normal cervix is different from the gene expression in normal colon on a chromosome-wide basis. In other words, genes on chromosome 7 are more important in for colorectal physiology than genes on chromosome 3. Genes on chromosome 3 are more important for cervical physiology than genes on chromosome 7. So, if you would have an extra copies of chromosome 3 in the cervix, of course you do better what you have to do anyway. We don't know. But it's certainly a testable hypothesis. Um, so, in other words, I'm intrigued about it because it would change the, you know, the, the concept of carcinogenesis because the initial impetus would, would, would be driven by physiology and not. And I can tell you we have so far preliminary evidence that the gene expression, normal tissue in the cervix compared to the colon is different. So Cervix sets, expresses more three genes and colon more seven genes. So this it's not published yet, and we have to confirm it with a large data set and so on and so on. But uh, a long answer to your uh, question. Any question directly related? Yeah. <clears throat> Do you know if there are three D or four D differences of these genes in the cervix and the colon in their position on the nucleus or? And actually, I thought about that last night, <laughs> but we don't know yet. But uh, the, it's a very good uh, the, the suggestion. The problem, obviously, also is already always is if you do uh, com some confirmation capture, it's a mixture. It, it, it's a, it's very difficult to do it from single cells. But we will try to do normal one single or maybe a few normal colon cells compared to a few normal cervical cells to ask the question, yeah, is there actually uh, a structural correlate yeah. of the changes uh, in normal uh, cervix compared to normal colon? Very good question, of course. But we don't know yet. Yeah. So do you think there's any role for chromosomal instability in, in cancer, or is it really just chromosomal desegregation occurring at typical rates and then being selected for? We don't know yet. We will find out. Um, but, but sure, we have chromosomal instability. But at the end of the day, it's the selection of the genomic copy number change, the spe tissue-specific genomic copy number change. So, and in that sense, um, the concept of chromosomal instability was intuitive, but it didn't lead in the right direction. 
I can give you another example. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, the, the same group that, uh, the, 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 the Broad Institute, right? They, they have all the money sequence, all these uh, tumors in the TCGA initiative. So they sequenced, I think, um, whatever, 300 uh, uh, cervical carcinoma and normal, matched normal tissue. So then they um, presented the results again in the Nature paper. Identified recurrent mutations <coughs> in 8% of the cervical carcinoma in PIK38. We knew that. They found new mutations which occurred in 3% at the most of all cervical carcinomas and then make a big hoopla hoop and say now we can target them and cure cervical carcinoma. Not a single word in this paper that all cervical carcinomas have an extra copies of chromosome 3 gene. Not a single word. And this is barking up the wrong tree. I'm completely convinced. But don't get me started with that. <laughs> no, no, you see, the, the concept that you don't try to understand what is always there and say, now you found the cure for cervical cancer because you find a mutation present in 5% of the cures. It's, no, I don't say it. It's wrong. I think it's wrong. OK, more questions? So yeah. uh, Thomas, you, you um, showed us those beautiful examples of adding the chromosome through to make uh, aneuploid cells. And your conclusion was that um, you get increased gene expression from all three of those chromosomes. <coughs> how, how did you show that? Well, the dosage goes up. Right, I understand the dosage went up and the level of RNA went up. That level of RNA it, it went up. I'm right. not saying that we have more transcription, we have more product. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you. Uh, so unless you look at which chromosome is producing the RNAs, you don't know the actual mechanism for that increase. Um, if you have, if you, can, if you have the, the same transcriptional activity, you just have more to transcribe from. That would be an explanation. I don't know. I it cannot is. answer that's the question. True. I cannot answer the question. Yeah. We would love to do it a little specific, but uh, that's obviously yeah. adds more complexity. With humans. Uh, okay. huh? With humans. Yeah. yeah. Right. 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 You can do it in a bit because a mouse, it's the same. I mean, if you, I didn't talk about it. Yeah. If you put normal mouse cells into culture, they, unlike human cells, sp uh, spontaneously transform. Again, it's, uh, right. um, it requires copying opportunities. And it's a very good point. We have also entertained the possibility to do RNA fish and see which chromosomes are. But then it's again difficult because if you do the fish analysis, you don't know which chromosome is the one that was introduced. Yeah. And so it ain't easy. Thank you. Good. No, no question? Sure. Oh, no. No? Okay, thank you. Thank you.